Almost whenever I speak with order members about climate change, it is clear to me that people care often a great deal about this issue. And the conversations I have often involve three broad schemes. First, only a partial appreciation of the urgency of the situation. Second, a lack of confidence that we can do something meaningful about it. And third, sometimes fairly commonly, mixed feelings about just what this has to do with the Dharma anyway. So today I will speak about those three things. I'd like to add on a personal note that I do feel a little nervous standing here. I'm aware that I flew quite a long way to get here. <laughs> First of all, the urgency of the situation. Just to say a few things about this. Probably the most striking fact that I can think of was something that came up in a report by Nicholas Stern to the UK government in 2006 that now up to 50% of all species are at risk from extinction from climate change by the end of this century. Half of all life forms gone. To that one could add of course a massive increase in the number of lethal heat waves. Subuti told me the other day that in Maharashtra this year the temperature reached 52 degrees centigrade. That's 125.6 Fahrenheit. Uh, of course, droughts, uh, forest fires, floods on a massive scale, huge increases in storms and hurricanes, a drastically increased number of refugees, a drastically increased political and economic stability, food shortages and outright famines, the increased spread of diseases such as malaria and dengue fever, rising sea levels that could easily submerge whole nations, or whole island nations, and a large number of the world's coastal cities and towns, including the one that I'm currently moving to, New York, and the, um, the disruption of the monsoon in Asia with all of the consequences that result from that. And it's already becoming erratic. The matter is only made more urgent by the rate at which carbon is being emitted. While political momentum is definitely growing to address this at a way that it never had, has before, and despite the, the fact that renewable energy is being used at exponentially increasing rates, the world's total carbon emissions so far remain relatively similar to previous years at around 50 billion tonnes per year. Now, in order to avoid the worst consequences of climate change, which would occur once the world's temp temperature exceeds two degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels, they've worked out exactly how much more carbon we can afford to emit. The number is somewhere between 500 and 1,000 billion tonnes more. The reason for a lack of an exact figure is that it varies depending on just how certain you want to be. At 500 billion tonnes, we've got a 90% chance of keeping it under such a temperature increase. At 1,000 billion tonnes, it's about two-thirds. So in brief, we have the next 10 to 15 years, roughly the time until Nagabodi's next talk, <laughs> to prevent such a set of consequences that would be catastrophic and which would affect all forms of life on Earth for hundreds and hundreds of years. So what we do right now is not only extremely urgent, but also extremely potent. We are the generation that can do something about this. No one else will be able to say that. And yet the problem will only be fixed if everyone works on it together and now. For that reason, I would say, no one is able to say that this is not my issue. So much for the urgency. But what about the question as to what this has to do with Dhamma practice? Isn't it potentially a bit of a distraction? If we got more involved as a community in this question, isn't it possible that we might lose sight of the Dhamma? Surely this is something that environmental organisations should focus on and we should stick to the Dhamma. That is a view I hear 
fairly commonly in one form or another. The simple answer to this, from my point of view, is that this, it is Dharma practice. Doing what one can to prevent a huge deterioration in the conditions needed to support life and civilization is a straightforward application of the first precept. I'd like us to think of what we, I'd like us to think of doing what we each can as being as fundamental as being a vegetarian. And I think, however, any order member would still agree that we need to maintain our clear aim, that of transcending the whole of the human predicament and communicating this to the world. The only problem is we don't in 10 to 15 years we're not going to uproot enough greed, hatred and delusion at the core, at the deepest level, to make the difference that we need to keep our civilization intact. We've got some more basic things to do in the meantime. What this all brings up is the relationship, even the creative tension, between inner work on one's mental states and outer work on changing the world. And perhaps that's what these four talks are all pointing to today. As Nagabodhi reminded us yesterday, there is Bhante's teaching of the bitendential value of being. So we need to engage with this crisis. When we engage with it, it needs to be done in such a way that we remain aware of our own states of mind and also encourage those around us to do likewise. This is basic Buddhism. So then what can we do about it? I'd like to suggest that as a community, we have an enormous amount that we can do about it, far more than a couple of thousand other people in the world. And I'd like to start by celebrating what we actually do well. I don't want to override that. Um, we practice not buying too many things and sharing those if we live in communities. We're vegetarians and vegans. There is the extraordinary work done by Guyapati and others in Ecodharma. There is Buddhist Action Month. And I particularly want to celebrate what Adhisthana has done in the last few years really put its money where its mouth was and spent, I understand, £350,000 on a biomass boiler system that means 89% of its energy use comes from renewable energy. Sadhu indeed. Nonetheless, there's an awful lot more that we in Tree Ratna could do, and I'd like to suggest that we think in terms of three spheres of influence. First of all, there's the individual level, changing our own personal habits. This is very important, but very often the discussion of this topic in our movement can start and finish at this level. So I'm not going to spend too much time on that today. Then there is the level of the Sangha, reducing the carbon emissions of the institutions of our movement. And finally, there is the level of societal change. On the level of our Sangha, I'd like to recommend that all centres make use of Amla Ketu's very good Sustainable Buddhist Centre certification. There's a lot more I could say, but most of what you'll find, most of what, you'll find most of what you need in that tool. On the level of societal change, I'm going to suggest a range of things from the easy to the more, challenge, more challenging. First, let's help climate activists to reduce their stress. <laughs> It's a hard job saving the world. And become more aware of their own minds, which I admit many of us need to, by offering them outreach meditation classes, perhaps for free. Let's offer volunteers to climate change organisations. It's hard to get a good volunteer. If you've got five people that will reliably turn up and all they need to do is phone one person, then that's quite something. Let's hold letter writing days in our centres and our communities and write to our local elected members. Let's invite them to the centre to speak about climate change and answer questions from those of us who are there on the day. Let's go on climate change protests as a Sangha. Be visible as a Sangha. Wear your kesa. Practice the metta bhavana in the street. Some people may even wish to join with some of the non-violent direct action protests that are happening, as uh, Artacharya and Virija did in Australia recently when, in Newcastle, north of Sydney, they helped support an event in which hundreds of protesters went out on kayaks, they didn't themselves, they're on the ground crew, and peacefully brought to a halt the biggest coal port in Australia for a day. 
Let's find ways of helping those in our movement in India to get access to reliable solar electricity and buildings that are cool enough to survive in a heat wave. Then there is divestment. I'd like us to get involved in the movement to divest completely from any financial support of the fossil fuel industries. I think this is within the reach of every order member. So this means who you bank with. I know a lot of people here will already bank with Triodos or the co-op, but many of us don't. Any other investments? Trust me, if you don't know, if you've got investments, if you don't know whether that they have something to do with the fossil fuel industries, they probably do. Most people, if not everybody, a lot of people will have a pension fund. There are pension funds that specialise in being ethical. Many people will have done that already. It's worth checking, does your pension fund support the fossil fuel industry? And finally, there is who your electricity company is. Can you change to one that does 100% green? And I'd like to suggest that those four things to do with uh, divestment is not just a good idea for all order members, but I think they should be a prerequisite for becoming a Mitra. <laughs> and there are actually three levels on which we can do this. We can do this ourselves as individuals. Uh, we can divest the bank accounts or whatever other investments that our centres and institutions may have. And we can run events at our centres. We can have divestment days at our centres. Um, and believe me, this makes a lot of difference. Uh, in Australia recently, you may have become aware of the, the tragic bleaching of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, there's a proposed coal mine nearby. It's so big that the emissions from it would be equivalent almost to Germany. Uh, However, the, in, the, investment, the investor concerned, a guy called Adani from India, is finding it difficult to find a financial partner to go along with him. HSBC looked at it and ran shy because of the divestment movement. So it can make a difference. In short, we need to educate, agitate and organise. And we need to find ways of doing this together and in a way that builds Sangha. When 35 of us from the Melbourne Sangha recently went out on a protest of 50,000 people in the street just prior to the climate summit in Paris last year, we started the day by meditating in the street next to placards that read Buddhists for Climate Action. And we marched under a huge banner carefully painted by Dharma Masi with the same words on it. People stopped and stared and took photos. They came up to us as we marched and asked us where we were from. So much of the world's young idealism is caught up in the climate movement and most of the time we're not engaged with it. If you are interested in knowing more about divestment, there's a website called gofossilfreegods.org. If you'd like to know more about what you can do to make a difference, please come to this afternoon's workshop. Um, there will be a discussion as well about to what extent our Sangha should be involved in this issue in the first place if you want to raise that question. Um, before I hand on to Amala, a few days I wrote to, ago I wrote to Bansi and asked if he would be willing to dictate a short paragraph on this issue for me to read to you here today. And he wrote back saying that he very much appreciated the work I was doing in connection with climate change as well as my request that he make such a statement but that he was unable to do so as the issue is too complex to be condensed into a few sentences. He did say, though, that he has his own feelings about this, which can be found in one of his poems, in which he suggested that I read out. Some of you will have heard such a Hajjatara read this before. It's called an apology. We live in the age of apologies. Here is an apology that is much more meaningful than any, many being made today. Mankind owes a profound apology to the birds for having polluted the air through which they fly, to the ape and the tiger for just having destroyed the forests in which they live, to the deer and the basin, bison for ruthlessly hunting them almost to extinction, 
to the rivers and streams for poisoning them with chemicals, to the earth itself for greedily pillaging its riches of silver and gold, to the ocean for slaughtering the greatest of her children, the whale for scientific purposes, to the mountain peaks for defiling, defiling their virgin snows with our trash, to the moon for rudely invading her sacred space, to the stars for obscuring their brightness with the smoke of our cities, to the sun for not gratefully acknowledging our dependence on his beauty, and to the truly great men and women of the past for not honouring their memory as we should, for not walking in their footsteps.